Welcome to the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. We have a very exciting session with a conference review related to PrEP that Dr. Steckler is going to give. Before she does, I, I just wanted to make a quick announcement that after the talk today, we'll have some open time for Q&A related to PrEP. So please think about your most pressing one or two PrEP related questions. And after Joanne's review of the conference data, we'll have a few minutes just for question and answer related to anything PrEP related. With that, Joanne, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, and thank you very much for having me back again. So I'm gonna, as Brian said, talk with you a little bit about the International AIDS Conference that just happened in Durban. Just as a disclaimer, I did not actually attend. I was viewing them online, which I have this link here at the bottom of our outline today. And just a caveat that some of these um, abstracts are better recorded than others. So uh, in the IPER game one, there's actually a protest that happens that gets recorded. So just FYI, have an open mind as you decide to look at some of these. So we're gonna talk a little bit about PrEP utilization in the US and how things have changed over the last few years, a little bit about PrEP plus treatment as prevention and the Partners Demonstration Project, some more data from IPER game, that's intermittent PrEP, and then a nice review from Bob Grant about drug resistance. And I realize I have acute HIV screening on here, but didn't um, include those slides, but we can talk about it a little bit. And then just a quick mention of all of the future PrEP candidates that are in various stages of trials and evaluation. And again, that link if you want to look and watch some of these talks. So very quickly, um, I just wanted to show some data that probably for those of you who are doing PrEP, mirrors what your own experience has been. This is data that was presented by folks from Gilead, caveats there, um, when they asked for national prescription data of Truvada. They got information from 80% of the retail pharmacies, notedly missing our, the Kaiser Pharmacy um, and I think one or two of the other sort of large scale pharmacies. But 80% of retail, retail pharmacies prescription information um, and then tried to isolate the folks who are only receiving Truvada, FTC, TDF, and then presenting data here from 2012 when it was FDA approved until the last quarter of 2015. The bars on the slide are by quarter, by year, and obviously there's a, been a huge increase over time in what we're seeing is in PrEP prescriptions. I don't have on the slide, but what they included was uh, gender breakdown. And very interesting that this increase that we're seeing has been predominantly in men, presumably mostly among men who have sex with men. And then also some really interesting data by uh, region of the United States. What you see on this slide in the heat map is in darker colors, the areas of the United States, the states that are most heavily um, affected by HIV, and then lighter ones obviously being less uh, impacted by HIV. The listing of cities is the top 20 cities in the United States, the top uh, 20 prescriptions, number of prescriptions by city. And what first highlighted is the number one city for new prescriptions for PrEP in 2015 was New York, not unexpectedly, with almost 3,000 new prescriptions written in 2015. Then looking at sort of the West, where we are, the number two and I guess five, six number of prescriptions in San Francisco, where obviously there's been a big push to have PrEP for men of sex with men. And then Seattle does really well uh, in terms of our size for the number of prescriptions. So kudos for those of you who are in Seattle and prescribing. I think the real gap um, is the Southeast, which is of course one of the most disproportionately impacted areas and the few number, few cities that are represented here and the fewer numbers of new prescriptions happening. And I think this isn't particularly surprising, but just is an area where those of us who do PrEP implementation really need to focus, focus on the Southeast. The other um, comment that they made is that, uh, again, not surprising, is that 2015, these numbers account for about 40 to 55% of all of the new starts in each city. So again, representing the fact that most of the prescriptions are increasingly, we're just having increasing numbers of prescriptions. I think we're gonna move on now to the Partners Demonstration Project. Um, as some of you may remember, the Partners uh, PrEP Project was a study that was a randomized study of Truvada and Tenofovir compared to placebo that was run out of the University of Washington with Jared Baton and the PI. 
This is a new project run by um, Jared Baton that was an open label interventional study of looking at the integration of antiretroviral therapy and, uh, and PrEP among, again, discordant couples. The project was conducted at four clinical sites in Africa. The overall goal was to evaluate a implement implementation science project, a scalable delivery system for PrEP and antiretroviral therapy for HIV prevention within couples. In addition to that, there was counseling, adherence, promotion, and other follow-up that was intended to be implementable, widely scalable for public health settings. And this uh, project was going on between 2012 through this past summer, during the summer. There were two strategies that they used in order to integrate treatment as prevention and PrEP. In the first case, um, these were discordant couples, again, one person positive, one person negative. In the first case, what you can see at the top of the slide is that the HIV positive individual elected to go on treatment immediately. In that case, the HIV negative person was given PrEP for this period of time, the first six months, um, while the HIV positive individual is theoretically detectable and therefore infectious. PrEP was discontinued after six months in these couples. The second case was where the individual for, who was HIV positive for whatever reason delayed antiretroviral therapy. During this time, PrEP was started immediately and continued again until the person who was HIV positive had been on therapy for six months. And modeling has showed that this is effective and cost effective. So the data that they presented at IAS was the number of new infections in this population. And it's compared against an a, there's no placebo in here, it's compared against an expected situation with having over a thousand serodiscordant couples um, and the expected frequency of, of sex and therefore the expected number of transmissions. And they would have expected 83 infections in this population for an incidence of 4.9 per 100 person years. And what they actually saw was four infections for incidence of 0.2 per 100 person years or a 95% reduction against this compared expected situation. And just to look at the four people who did seroconvert, obviously these are the HIV negative individuals in uh, serodiscordant partners, that um, in all of these cases, the individuals either did not use PrEP or the treated, uh, the HIV positive individual did not use antiretroviral therapy. So no true failures of treatment as prevention or PrEP. I think moving on, I think there's a lot of uh, interest in the potential use for intermittent PrEP. Again, I'm just gonna review the randomized trial for iPergay, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about their OLA, their open label extension. So for those of you, um, just to do a little refresher, iPergay, the structure of it was that uh, if you knew you were going to have sex, you would take two tablets of Truvada two to 24 hours before sex, and then one tablet 24 hours later and another tablet another uh, 24 hours later. So uh, supposedly a total of four pills per episode. If you continue to have repeated exposures during this week, you might continue to take one Truvada uh, every day um, until you got to two days past your last sexual exposure. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve from the modified intention to treat that was um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015, just showing obviously um, impact of uh, Tenofovir FTC in preventing HIV acquisitions. So this group had a median follow-up of 9.3 months, 16 individuals were infected, 14 of whom were in the placebo arm for a 86% relative reduction in the incidence of HIV using this strategy. And the figure that you're gonna see is number needed to treat. So the number needed to treat to prevent one HIV infection in this population was 18. So moving into um, ipergay OLA, again, these are people who were uh, randomized initially either to the placebo or to active drug, but again, they were blinded. And so they, during unblinded, they were unblinding, they were allowed to continue on unblinded Truvada, again, using the same intermittent strategy. And there were about, I think, 30 additional individuals who were recruited into the um, OLA, into the open label extension. What this slide shows is just a table of all of the characteristics at the time of the open label extension in terms of their demographics and the risk. And the thing I really wanted to point out is the number NB, in this case stands for number, the number of sexual acts in this population in the prior four weeks. Trying to get a little bit to the idea of is intermittent prep 
intermittent PrEP or is it daily PrEP just with frequent sexual exposure so people are taking more than four, five, six doses a week, so the equivalent of daily PrEP. So what you can see is that the number of sexual acts in the prior two weeks and the average comes to about two sexual acts per week. And so people are often taking four or five or even more um, pills of Truvada during a week, uh, at least in over half of this Olay cohort. Uh, this slide shows the number of HIV infections and the incidence in this. The first two rows are the placebo and incidence was uh, 6.6 .6 per 100 person years compared to placebo was just under one. That's that 86% reduction that they presented. So what's new here is this open label data and that in this group that were followed for a median of about a year and a half, the incidence was even lower than in the active group in the original randomized trial for a incidence of about 0.2 per 100 person years. And this translates if you're going to compare against the placebo, which again, whether or not the valid or not, uh, comes to a 97% relative reduction. Again, we know that in these open label trials, adherence is better because number one, we know that um, people are on active drug and so they know they're actually getting the real thing, as well as in the open label extensions, we know that PrEP works. And so people perhaps are more motivated in these open label extension trials compared to the original placebo controlled randomized clinical trials. Again, getting back to the question of was this really intermittent PrEP or is this just daily PrEP? One of the things we're gonna look at in this slide is uh, adherence is measured by pill count. There's a heat map um, shown on the left looking at in individuals in the open lake bowl extension brought back their pill bottles every two months and the estimate of the number of pills taken is shown in this color scheme with the darker colors representing more pills taken per month. Again, taking the number of pills dispensed minus the number of pills returned is the estimate of number of pills taken. There was a comment during this presentation um, that they heard that because PrEP was not currently approved for use in PrEP that people were stock stocking their trial medications so that this may be an over-representation of adherence in this trial. But again, it appears in terms of the number of pills taken per month that were going effectively equivalent to daily dosing. So I think still really question to be determined is in the people who were really doing this intermittently, how well does that work as a strategy? And how well does the strategy of you only need to have taken uh, two pills before you have your exposure or in the sort of the stopping question that you only need to take two days after your last exposure. I think that question for me is still not yet clear. Uh, I just was gonna comment that the one person who got infected in the global label extension wasn't actually taking uh, PrEP. At least that's the, the understanding. This final slide on iPergay is looking at the proportion of sex acts that were adequately covered by this dosing strategy. And what you see in the left column is the proportion who are estimated to be covered, uh, at least in terms of their definition, was one pill before and one pill after, so not exactly matching their strategy. Suboptimal, which would I presume is one slightly different, so either one pill before or one pill after, but not both, uh, or not covered at all. And these are um, percentages that you'll see. And then compared to the open label extension, this p-value uh, is a test of whether more people were adequately covered by Truvada during their last sex act. And in the open label extension, it's not surprising that they were, but still only 50% were adequately covered according to their dosing strategy based on their ability to use Truvada according to taking two doses before, one dose after sex, and one dose uh, 24 hours after that total of 48 hours. This was a nice review done by Bob Grant looking at the relative impact of drug resistance in these trials compared to the, the impact of preventing HIV infection. And what this slide shows is all of the infections that occurred among individuals in these initial six randomized trials. So five infections that had drug resistance among 9,222 participants who received active PrEP compared to the number of drug resistant infections that happened in the placebo organ arm, again, because transmitted drug resistance does occur among 6,672 individuals who received placebo. So the overall chance of drug resistance taking everyone on PrEP was 5 out of 9,222, or 0.05%, with a number needed to harm 
of not quite 2,000. The number of individuals to prevent one HIV infection in these trials ranged from 13 to 60. So overall, this big impact of preventing HIV compared to the small risk of drug resistance happening as a result of uh, being given PrEP. To dig into this a little bit deeper, what you see on this slide are the individuals who actually had acute HIV infection at the time they were started on PrEP. So these initial randomized trials only screened initially with antibody screening, so missed people who were in the window period, who were antibody negative with acute HIV infection. The second set of columns are individuals who were HIV, truly HIV negative at the time that they started. And one of the things that we know is that if you start PrEP at the time you are acutely infected, that is really the biggest risk for getting drug resistance. So about a third of individuals who started PrEP at the time of acute infection developed drug resistance. Compared to, again, 5% of individuals, one out of the 18, who had acute infection at starting. So transmitted drug resistance happened. And again, a much lower number of, a much lower proportion of people who were HIV negative start, who were on PrEP, who acquired HIV, a much smaller proportion acquired drug resistance. So digging down into the numbers, overall there are nine excess drug resistant infections. And again, I should say these are individuals who got Truvada, tenofovir, emtricitabine, not including the, the studies that only included tenofovir. Um, in these groups, there were 92 infections averted by Truvada-based PrEP. So there were eight infections averted every time there was a drug-resistant infection. But if we could exclude acute infections um, at the time of starting PrEP, there were 22 infections averted per drug-resistant infection. Dr. Grant and the IPREX Olay have done a little bit of work looking at the benefit of screening um, for acute HIV, which is what I didn't include in these slides here. Um, and although the sensitivity is high, the specificity is low, meaning that when you have symptoms of acute HIV, most often it is not acute HIV, um, but still in my perspective, better to screen for acute HIV and not start PrEP if you are concerned that there may be a possible acute HIV infection there, again, because of the possibility of drug resistance. And then very quickly, I'm sorry I'm over time, um, I just wanted to list the drugs that are currently in various stages of study that um, were presented, including Maraviroc, which we've talked about a little bit of, about both in the male and the female cohort. The female cohort was what was presented here at this conference. There are several long-acting injectables that are being studied, including ropivirine and cabotegravir. Uh, there's a phase three study that's been presented several times of the depivirine ring. Um, showing some benefit, particularly in some subgroups. Um, and there was no information that I could find about TAF or Descovy at this, at this conference, although as we've mentioned, there's a randomized clinical trial that's hopefully gonna start in the next few months. So I think those are all of my slides and I'll open it for questions.